and I'm going to introduce Ed. Ed Hale is a retired middle school teacher, history teacher from Keystone Oaks School District. During his 35 years, he taught most of U.S. history, covering a period from discovery up to the pre-Civil War era. Recently, in his spare time, he has been volunteering as a crew member on the U.S. Brig Niagara, which we will have next year. His talk on that. Recently, in his spare time, he has been volunteering as a crew member on the U.S. Brig Niagara, the flagship of Pennsylvania based in Erie, doing day sales and extended voyages. His interests also include traveling, metal detecting, bicycling, and computers. He has taught in OSHA classes on the War of 1812, the Great Catholic Shannon Bank Robber, and on using math and computers. He has done some freelance writing for several magazines at the Pittsburgh Post. So let's give a big hand. taught uh, eighth graders for almost 35 years, so I can pretty much handle a group this age, believe me. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> they're awful. They're awful. Awesome. Uh, I always give a uh, shameless plug uh, before I begin uh, on, on my other talk, which is in Niagara, and I'll be doing that uh, hopefully sometime next year, uh, whenever they can schedule me in, so I always put my ship up here on the uh, screen so uh, I can... Uh, Tell you just a quick thing, thing or two about it. Uh, the ship is uh, a replica from the War of 1812, uh, fought the Battle of Lake Erie in uh, September of 1813. Uh, I'm a crew member, my wife and I are both crew members. Uh, we sail on board the ship and sails the five Great Lakes and as far as Quebec up the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, it is quite an adventure. You can do day sails. Uh, on the ship, go out uh, in, in the summertime, you take people out and you get to see what it's like to sail on a tall ship uh, for this time period. And I always like to point out something, people look at this and they don't always get the scale of what they're looking at. That's a person right there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, not me, but it has been me. I, I, I climb up here all the time. When needed. So, okay. So that's uh, my shameless plug. And by the way, if you like what you hear tonight, both on uh, the robbery or if you have an interest in the uh, Niagara, uh, afterwards, uh, come on up and uh, pick up one of my cards. And uh, uh, welcome to uh, give me a call or send me an email and uh, schedule me for any kind of group organization that you might belong to. Uh, and that's pretty much how I, I get my uh, opportunities to talk to people is just pretty much word of mouth. So uh, we're going to talk uh, about the uh, Great Castle Chain of Bank Robbery. Uh, some of you probably have never heard of that. In fact, most people in Pittsburgh have never heard of it. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's an amazing story, to say the least, of uh, Vigilanteism and uh, uh, love and, and uh, some interesting hijinks uh, in, in uh, robbing this bank. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you tonight, uh, by the way, I hate working with microphones, so if, if the microphone disappears halfway through this, that would be why. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you is based on a tremendous amount of research. Uh, that a friend of mine and I did uh, back in 1997. Uh, what happened was uh, I was uh, researching and writing an article uh, on the zoo that existed in Castle Shannon in the 1870s. Did you know there was a zoo in Castle Shannon in the 1870s? Well, there was. And I was reading this uh, uh, one piece of uh, information, and the person who had written it said, and it was right in the area where the zoo was, is where they killed one of the bank robbers. And I thought, what bank robbers are they talking about that were killing Castle Shannon? So I set that uh, aside, because that set this up a lot more exciting, and I started researching the, uh, this bank robbery. Well, a friend of mine who uh, was a, uh, a, a reporter for the Post-Gazette 
uh, we were having breakfast one morning, and he said to me, well, what are you working on? I said, well, uh, I'm working on this bank robbery thing that happened in the Castle Shannon in 1917. And he said, well, tell me about it. So I started to tell him, and he said, wow, we have to take this and put this in uh, more than just a magazine article. He said, I want this to end up in the Post-Gazette. So it did. So in uh, uh, 1997, he and I wrote a, an article that turned out to be the largest article that the Post-Gazette has ever done on this style of, uh, 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 of a story. And, uh, and we actually eventually won a, uh, uh, an award called the Matrix Award uh, for the article. So uh, the article that you're, or the story you're about to hear uh, has been well researched. And uh, sometimes when you hear stories about local interest, they tend to get exaggerated. They tend to grow as, as uh, the stories are told and retold uh, over and over again. But what I'm going to tell you tonight is based on fact. And, and, and let me tell you how I can say that. First of all, we researched this and found all of the trial transcripts. And so all the witnesses that testified at the trials, we have their exact words, the words that they spoke uh, in relation to this robbery. So you'll hear me quote some of this stuff as we go along. We have newspaper articles from uh, five or six of the newspapers that were in existence in Pittsburgh at that time. It wasn't like today where there's just the Post-Gazette. Uh, at that time, there were a, a significant number of newspapers. It's how people got the news. There were radios and television and uh, the internet and so on. So people uh, read newspapers, amazingly. Um, on top of that, in the process of doing our research, we got uh, sent in the direction of uh, a woman who was uh, in her uh, 80s, late 80s, uh, whose mother had been the janitor at the bank during the time uh, that the bank was robbed. And uh, we went to interview her, and it turned out that it wasn't her mother we needed to be hearing about. It was this lady. She actually was home and witnessed the bank robbery. So we had uh, an eyewitness account of the robbery uh, uh, to uh, work with as we uh, wrote this story. So the story is really based uh, the story I'm going to tell you is based on as much actual fact as we were able to uncover. Sorry about that. I, I teach computers. I should be on the computer work. Well, back in uh, the early 1900s, Castle Shannon was a coal mining and farming village. And when I say village, uh, we're talking uh, uh, somewhere around 1,000 people or so. Not a lot of people living here. You can see the houses are scattered uh, throughout Castle Shannon. And Shannon was, uh, uh, as I said, primarily a coal town. And one of the things that, uh, as a result of being a coal town, uh, that you can see is the landscape itself. If you notice, looking at this picture, as you look across here, what's missing? Trees. And the reason for that, and all the trees that you see are small, all right, the reason for that is, in this time period, every tree that they could cut down, they cut down, sent to the sawmills, uh, one of the 72 sawmills that ran from Castle Shannon down to the Keys Rocks on Sawmill Run, all right, and they were uh, cut up into timbers and taken down to the mines to hold up the roofs of the mines. So most of the trees in Castle Shannon today are 100 years old, or in that range. There's very, very, very few trees that you'll find in Castle Chain that are much more than 100 years old. Uh, this little church right up here on the top of this hill uh, was picked up in 1911 and carried down the hill, dragged down this street, and then dropped on a vacant lot down here, which uh, is another story in itself, uh, kind of an interesting one. It's my church, where I go to church today. And in fact, my house, is right up, almost within about uh, 200 feet of where the uh, church was originally. So, Castle Shannon was this, this tiny little village. And 
the uh, downtown section of Castle Shannon uh, consisted of several businesses. Uh, we have a, a clothing store, and there's a general store, and over here is a grocery store. This was the Odd Fellows Hall, uh, which is still there today. Uh, and behind the grocery store, or next to the grocery store, is the bank that we're going to be talking about that gets robbed. The street right here, which was a dirt uh, road at that time, is called Poplar. And uh, again, uh, the street is still there today. And uh, up here on the hillside is what's today called Mount Lemon Golf Course. At that time, it was Castle Shannon Golf Course. But there was a land deal and a swap and all sorts of things that went on. And Mount Lemon uh, ended up uh, this land and kept the uh, golf course. So downtown Castle Shannon was a uh, uh, you know just a small business area. Uh, right uh, today, where there is a new brew pub called uh, uh, Mindful Brewery, used to be McGinnis Brothers uh, Grocery Store. There was a hotel there at one time called a, a Hotel Waterman, and Hotel Waterman uh, figures into the story. Uh, what I'm going to do, what I'm doing here, is going to set the stage, giving you some landmarks to keep in mind as I tell the story. Uh, the Hotel Waterman, right there at the corner of what today is Castle Shannon Boulevard and uh, Route 88. Uh, the little baby being held here by this man, her name was Ray Phillips, a, a Ray Waterman at the time. And uh, Ray uh, had a, an older brother, uh, William, who's somewhere in this picture, I'm not sure which one I think it's. I think it's this one here. And he was a um, uh, teller at the bank that is about to be robbed. And uh, we interviewed her, but she didn't really uh, know much because, as you can see, she was an infant uh, at the time uh, that this is all going to take place. But the bank uh, robbery uh, is directly connected to this hotel because of the, the uh, leader of the uh, gang that's about to rob the bank uh, used the hotel as a place or came to the hotel one day uh, as a place to get a meal, and from there hatched his plan to rob the bank. This is uh, Willow Avenue, but at that time it was called Railroad Street. It's not a very uh, good picture, but it was a dirt road, as all the roads in Castle Shannon, with the exception of one, uh, were all just dirt roads in 1917. This is the same uh, road from a different angle. Back here again, this is the Odd Fellows Hall, and this is the general store and the clothing store. And behind the Odd Fellows Hall is the bank and so on. Uh, the railroad tracks you see going through here, uh, if you go down to this same location today, that's what it looks like. All right, Hasn't changed a great deal. Uh, the buildings have been remodeled to some extent. But you can see there's the Odd Fellows Hall still sitting there. Uh, and these were the, uh, the markets. They've all been remodeled and changed. But in essence, uh, the layout is uh, virtually the same as it was in 1917. Then we have the bank itself. Uh, right up around the corner from what we were just looking at on Poplar was the bank. It was the first national bank. And it was this imposing Greek revivalist architecture that gave this bank this incredibly secure, uh, solid look. And that was done on purpose. That's the way they built banks in this time period, to give people that feeling that their money was secure. I mean, look at this bank. It's you know, brick and it's giant columns and bars on the windows and so on. So it gave people uh, a real secure feeling about putting their money in this bank. Well, standing in front of the bank are the three bank tellers. Here's the head teller. His name is Daniel McLean. His assistant was a man named Frank Irby. And in the middle here is William Waterman, uh, whose parents owned the Waterman Hotel. Uh, this picture was taken literally days before the bank robbery, and before it's all over, two of these men are going to be dead. I want you to notice something also here. Uh, on the bank, at the bank this time, there were about five steps, five or six steps, that uh, went from the street right into the bank. Well, it's not that way today. If you go there today, the bank now has another entire flight of stairs added on. And the reason for this 
is that when they went, they finally decided to pay Poplar right in front of the bank, there was too much of a hump going from the end of Poplar down to what would now be Castle Shannon Boulevard. At that time, it was called Washington Avenue. There was literally an embankment. The, the road dead-ended, an embankment, the railroad tracks, and then uh, Castle Shannon Boulevard. In order to connect the road to Castle Shannon Boulevard, they had to lower the road. So for about a quarter of a mile, from the railroad tracks all the way back up Poplar, they, they lowered, they dug it down, dug it down, until they had a grade that would reach it. That caused the bank to no longer be right at street level, but now the bank was, instead of here at street level, now the bank had another whole flight of steps that were added to it. So this is the bank today. This is exactly what it looks like. And as you can see, it is virtually identical to the way it was in 1917. Okay, let's get to it. In 1917, it's no secret that Pittsburgh was a town full of immigrants. Many, many immigrants coming from all over the world to work in our steel mills. And part of the reason for that was uh, it was good pay by comparison. And second of all, you could work in a steel mill and not speak English. It didn't matter. The mills were so loud, there was so much noise going on in the mills, that most of the orders given were done by hand signals. And so all you had to do was go to the mill, get a job, uh, and just go in and learn the hand signals, and you could work inside the mill almost immediately. Well, four immigrants in town were from Russia. Mikhail, or Mike Tidoff, and another man, John Tush, lived together uh, in a boarding house uh, up in the Soho district of Pittsburgh. That's the area up around uh, Duquesne University. And uh, in uh, uh, another boarding house very close by were two other uh, Russians, Sam Barkons and Harass Garrison. They lived uh, nearby, and the four men were friends. They worked together in various mills and factories around town. But the problem was these men were not very nice guys. They were constantly getting in trouble, constantly being fired, constantly moving on to new jobs. They were, shall we say, not your best immigrants uh, uh, class of people coming into Pittsburgh. They were people that uh, we're looking for, in a sense, the easy way to make some money. And Mike Tidoff would one day be traveling down to Monongahela, Pennsylvania, by way of Castle Shannon. And as he came into Castle Shannon, he stopped to have lunch at the Waterman Hotel. Sitting in the Waterman Hotel, he could look directly out the window and across the way, because there were no trees in the way to block his view, as there are today, he saw the bank. And he looked at this bank, and he thought to himself, here I am, out in the middle of nowhere, to get from downtown Pittsburgh to Castle Shannon in those days, took at least an hour. Yeah. And so uh, he's looking at this, and he's thinking, I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's no police around. This bank is an easy target. And so he begins to hatch a plan to rob the bank. Now, we don't know when he told the other bank, the other uh, bank robbers or his gang, uh, about this idea. But somewhere along the line, he relays this information to them and convinces them that this is their way to easy money. And these other three men said, we're in. Now, in the process of researching them, uh, the names I'm using up here are names that uh, show up in the trial transcripts. But when we researched them, what we found was each of these men had at least three aliases. And you don't have aliases unless there's other reasons for needing an alias. So these were not easy people to 
to research and find out. The only one we could ever find a picture of was sand particles. Well, the plan to rob the bank required, of course, the one piece of, uh, of uh, material that they did not have, and that was a car. If you're going to rob this bank, you need to be able to get away. You don't want to take a streetcar after you've robbed the bank, uh, unless you're the commuter bandit from the 1960s. Uh, if you know that story, or if you remember that, the commuter bandit robbed 13 banks downtown Pittsburgh, made all his getaways on streetcars, and would run out, he would time robbing the bank so he knew when a streetcar would be there, run out, jump on the streetcar, and disappear. Uh, well, these men weren't that smart. But anyway, uh, they thought about this and they said to themselves, we need a car. We need a, uh, a, a transportation to get us down to, or out to Castle Shannon, and then to get us away. Well, Tidoff's uh, sister owned a boarding house in Universal PA, which is now called Penn Hills. And she had uh, a boarder that had just purchased a car. And she said to her brother, and he mentioned to her that he was looking for a car. Uh, we don't know if he told her what he wanted the car for, but uh, he told her that he needed a transportation out to Castle Shannon. And she told him, well, I have a porter. His name is Nick Kemnos, and he just purchased a car, and maybe he'd be interested. So somehow, uh, Tidoff gets in touch with Kemnos and says, would you be interested in driving us out to Castle Shannon? We'll pay you $7 to take us out there and drive us back. Kevin Oates says, well, uh, I, I guess so. He had just purchased this new Maxwell. This was one of the finest cars on the market in 1917. And when Tidoff saw this car, his eyes lit up. This was the perfect getaway car for a lot of reasons. One, it was a good, reliable, fast car, but it had something that very few cars in this time period had. And if you need to make a fast getaway, you want a car with an electric starter. You don't want to be robbing a bank and then out there <laughs> cranking the car, trying to get the car, here they come, crank the car and try to make a getaway. Not a good idea. So. This car was ideal. Now, I'm going to tell you straight out that Kemenos, I believe, knew nothing about this bank robbery from start to finish. And uh, later on, he'll come back into the story. But I want you to know that I believe, and Roger and I, who wrote the uh, article with me, uh, we both believe that he was not involved uh, in the bank robbery. And a couple things tell us that. One is his testimony and what was found on him after the robbery, and the fact that he just bought a car for $655 in 1917. That's more than a year's pay for the average steel worker, which tells me this man was not an average steel worker. He was working in a, the next level up type of job in the mills or wherever he was working. We never did discover where he worked, but I don't believe he would have been participating in this bank robbery because I don't think he needed to. I think he was already uh, doing uh, well financially. The plan was to drive the car into Castle Shannon and park on this road, which was at that time called Washington Avenue. Today it's Castle Shannon Boulevard. And this is a horrible picture, but it's the best one I, I have from the time. And they were going to park the car right in front of Dr. Brown's House. Now, where's Dr. Brown's house? If you're at all familiar with Castle Shannon, there's a shop and save in Castle Shannon on, on uh, uh, Castle Shannon Boulevard. Uh, if you're familiar with, uh, there's also the place called the Ice Castle. Okay, you might know where that is. Directly across the street from the Ice Castle is Dr. Brown's house. They were going to park the car there. Because that's where the paved road began. The only paved road in Castle Shannon started there and headed towards Dormont, Green Tree, Banksville in that direction. 
And if you're going to make a fast getaway and you're on mud streets, that could be a real problem. But Tidoff looked at this and said to himself, this is where we need to park the car. And by parking the car there, that meant they had to walk down to the bank, which was about uh, two to three hundred yards away. Not a long distance, but somewhat of a sprint uh, to get to the car if you happen to be being chased. Okay, now I need to tell you a little bit about the people in town. Now let me know who the, the bank robbers are. Let's talk about who uh, is in town. To begin with, we have a man who's the head cashier. His name is uh, Daniel H. A. McLean. McLean, uh, his wife Agnes, had just recently died, only within the last year, and had left him, left him a widow, widower with three uh, young children, uh, ages 15, Nine and four, or somewhere, five, something like that. He was a Sunday school teacher. He taught at uh, uh, Mount Lebanon Pres Presbyterian Church, uh, known as Twin Towers up there in Mount Lebanon, uh, Thomas Scott Road. And he was the head cashier. He was well loved in town. The, the people in town thought very highly of this man. And when his uh, wife passed away, the lady who was the janitor in the bank. Mrs. McKellar, she also uh, had just lost her husband, and she was now a single mom. And so these two kind of commiserated together. No hanky panky. They were just, they just became good, close friends. And they talked about raising children uh, by themselves, and she would sit with him after work, and they would uh, sit in the bank and talk uh, uh, in the evenings or afternoons when the bank was closed. Right after Agnes died, uh, Daniel took his family on vacation. They don't look very happy. <laughs> but there they were. He was trying to cheer his kids up by taking them out to Atlantic City and, of course, posing for the typical tourist photograph in that time period wearing your bathing suit. Okay. The second person that we need to know about is Frank Irby. He was 32 years old. Frank Irby was considered a, a handsome man. He was short, uh, about 5'7", about 5'6", five, 5'7". Seven, five, five, seven. And he had announced to his mom and dad that he was about to get engaged to a, a local girl by the name of Leona Greiner. And Frank Irby was known around town, again, well liked but he was a terrible flirt. He loved the ladies. And <clears throat> right next door to the bank, there was a grocery store, Martin's grocery store. And his teller window looked right to the wall where there was the bank window that looked into the grocery store's window. And there worked in that grocery store a young girl, 17 years old, who had a terrible crush on Frank. And Frank, of course, like any red-blooded male, took advantage of that and was constantly teasing with her and flirting with her. And what he would do is he kept, uh, at his teller window, he kept a little uh, tin cup, and when he wanted to get her attention, he would run it back and forth across the bars, which would, you know, clang, 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 clang. She'd come to the window at the grocery store, and he'd yell something, uh, you know, flirty over her, and she'd yell something back, and they'd, they'd have a good laugh. He lived with his mom and dad in the library in Pennsylvania. He came in every day on the streetcar. The morning of the bank robbery, and I'm not one into premonitions and all this kind of stuff, but he gets, he, he's eating breakfast with his mom, and he says to her, I have a bad feeling about today. I think I'm going to take my gun with me to work. And he does. He takes his pistol to work. Some of the townspeople, well, Margaret McKelton, 11 year old girl, she was the daughter of the janitor of the bank, and she's the lady we interviewed. Since the bank robbery took place right at lunchtime, right at noon, she happened to be home from school eating lunch and was sitting in the Odd Fellows Hall where their apartment was, facing directly to the front of the bank where, uh, where their uh, dining room table was. Uh, 
was the window that she was able to watch the entire bank robbery unfold. Then there's George Beltzuber. George Beltzuber, 34 years old, had gotten himself elected justice of the peace in town. Here was a man who was more full of himself than anybody you would ever meet. George was the biggest blowhard in town. He always walked around town, I should say strutted around town, smoking a big marsh wheeling stogie, and insisted that everyone call him Squire. Squire Beltsuver. Well, all the people who knew him since he was little Georgie in uh, uh, short pants, uh, you know, they, they hardly could tolerate this. But George was a uh, uh, pretty self-important guy. And uh, uh, his parents owned the local general store, uh, El Tumors, and uh, some of you in the front row can probably see this. I always like this. Tip top thread. When was the last time you heard tip top thread? Yeah, okay. uh, his parents were also the um, uh, postmasters, which was normal in that time period. It was a contract job position, and they ran the post office along with the general store. Their store was next to the uh, 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 clothing store, and then next to that was the Odd Fellows Hall here on Willow Avenue, or at that time it was called uh, Railroad Street. Then there's Dr. Carr. Dr. Carr was a physician in one of the coal companies. His house was just two doors away from the bank. His house uh, was situated right here on, on Poplar. Uh, this is his house. This is his examination room office. And here's the bank right here. And Dr. Carr was uh, worked for one of the coal mines uh, as a, a physician for the coal mine. Uh, and immediately after his bank robbery in 1917, uh, World War I has started, and he gets uh, sucked into uh, the war, uh, drafted as a physician for a regiment. Uh, if you go there today, there's his house, still there today, and here's his exam room, and here's the bank, okay? And notice, the same thing happened to his house that happened to the bank. Back in this time period, the steps came down to here, and you were at street level. But today, because they lower the street, his house is no longer at street level, there are a series of more steps that bring you down the street. So the street was graded uh, at quite a distance, about a quarter of a mile, uh, on its whole length. Some of the other people in the town that are going to be part of the posse that goes after the bank robbers, we have uh, Joseph Offerman, who owned the clothing store next to Beltzuber's store. And his uh, clerk, Mrs. Chandler, is the one that's going to sound the alarm for the bank, uh, bank robbery. Uh, right up the street was the pharmacy. Uh, run by J.J. Doyle. Today that pharmacy is Kimmy's Restaurant, uh, right in the corner uh, where there's the red light, the red light in Castle Shannon. <laughs> uh, then there's Ernest Fisher. He worked at Saxon Mall Nursery. Some of the folks who've been around a long time may remember on Route 88 the great big nursery that went up the side of the hill by Grove Road. It's called Saxon Mall Nursery. Uh, Fisher was the uh, uh, foreman or manager uh, there. Uh, then there's down uh, by what is today the Ice Castle was the railroad superintendent's office where Nick Yost uh, would be uh, sitting on duty and would be chasing uh, after the bank robbers. Then we have Stanley Rawa. Stanley Rawa happened to be in the bank on the day of the robbery. The only person in the bank. He was in there cashing a $100 check. What's kind of strange about Stanley is, from what we could find out, he was the only person in Castle Shannon who spoke Russian. And he just happened to be in the bank the day it gets robbed. Well, when Roger and I were writing this story, reading through the trial transcripts, Every trial, we have four trial transcripts, every trial, Stanley's testimony is different. <laughs> by the time we got through the fourth one, by the way, we have 
for 1,500 pages of trial transcripts that we uh, read through the researches. By the time we finished reading through this, Roger looked at me one night, we were sitting at the computer, and he said, this guy is dirty. And I said, you know, I was thinking the same thing. No one ever seemed to pick up on it, but, and I'll give you a little more information as we get into the robbery itself. So Stanley is in the bank on the day of the robbery. Okay, let's get to it. This is a map of downtown Castle Shannon that was printed in the, uh, 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 one of the newspapers, the uh, Pittsburgh Press, I believe, uh, at the time of the robbery. Uh, to give people somewhat of an orientation. So if you looked at this today, uh, this uh, road coming through here, this is Route 88. It's got a big bend in it. It doesn't have that bend today. But this is Route 88 coming through here. This is Castle Shannon Boulevard going up, up this way. At that time, it was called, what is wrong with my pointer here? This is uh, called Washington Avenue at that time. Here's Dr. Brown's house. This is where the ice castle is today. This is where Shop and Save would be today, up here, okay? This is the golf course, I love the golf course, uh, and the bank. The bank is right here. So when Tidoff first came out to Castle Shannon, he came out here and ate at Waterman's Hotel. And from Waterman's Hotel, he was able to look directly across and see the bank. Okay, it's only uh, uh, maybe 100 yards or thereabouts. It's a, a very short distance. And that's why the bank was so obvious to him at that time. So, the day of the robbery, May 14, 1917. Tidoff gets up out of bed at 7 o'clock in the morning, wakes up John Tush, and says to him, Get up, get up! It's my birthday. Today's the day we robbed the bank. Tush says, Okay. They get up. They break out a bottle of whiskey, 7 o'clock in the morning, and they start drinking. They have a couple of drinks and pack up their stuff, walk down to the other boarding house, wake up Raska Garrison and Sam Parkons. Same thing, tells them, come on, get up, get up. It's my birthday. Today's the day we're going to rob the bank. They finish the bottle of whiskey, and as they do, Sam, uh, uh, Nick Kemenos, arrives in the car. They jump in the car. Kevin says, okay, we're two. And he said, oh, you know what? We haven't had enough to drink yet. Let's go to the speakeasy over in Soho. So they go on over to a, a, a speakeasy, and they sit in there for another hour and a half drinking while Nick Kevin sits outside in the car. Now, if he's part of this whole plan to rob the bank, don't you think he'd been sitting in the bar drinking with these guys? You know, he's not the designated driver or something, okay? He's, he's clueless. He has no idea about what is about to happen. In fact, he testified at trial that when the men came out in the car, they virtually all just passed out. They were all dead drunk. They'd been drinking for four hours in the morning prior to jumping in the car. So they get in the car, and they head for Castle Shannon. As they said, it takes about an hour. They left around 11 o'clock. They arrive in Castle Shannon right around lunchtime, around noon. And they, they, uh, Tidoff tells them, I want you to park the car here facing away. Okay? You want to make a quick getaway, you don't want to have to turn the car around. Kevin says, oh, okay. So he parks the car in front of Dr. Brown's house and sits in the car. Tidoff and the, the other uh, three men get out of the car, and they begin walking down the street, heading towards the bank. As they're walking along, Tidoff says to them, okay, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to go in the front door first, then the three of you come in behind me. There will be no one else in the bank. I don't know how he knew that, but that's what he told them. As they're walking along, Tidoff begins to pull out of his pocket guns, and he hands each of the men a uh, semi-automatic pistol. They each had uh, 38 caliber 
semi-automatic pistols as they go into the bank. When they get to the bank, he said, we're going to go in the front door, walk over here to the teller's cage, and tell them to uh, open the door so we can go inside and rob the vault and then make our getaway uh, back out the front. That's the plan. The bank itself, the day after the robbery, this is what it looked like. This is exactly uh, the way it looked the day after. This is Frank Irby's teller's window. This is the window he would look out to yell at the young girl next door. And uh, he was uh, constantly uh, uh, you know, flirting with her. But this is the way the bank looked. Uh, this is a, a police photograph uh, from the time period. So they marched down to the bank and they entered the front door. Now, as they go in, they find that there's someone standing at the teller's window. Stanley Rawa happens to be there cashing a $100 check. Tush, John Tush, says to him, first in English and then in Russian, which Stan Rawa testified to, tells him to go sit over in this chair so that he could tie him up. Rawa goes over and sits down in the chair. Miraculously, Tush pulls a piece of rope out of his pocket. Who goes to a bank robbery carrying a rope? Unless, of course, you know that this man's going to be there and you need a way to tie him up. Rawa testified in one of the trials that the rope was so short that he had to hold it in one hand while he tied it around his wrists. Wow, that's a, a really effective way to hold this man down. As this is happening, as it begins to unfold, Frank Irby instantly realizes something's going on. He immediately dives behind his desk and grabs his pistol, and the battle is on. The two men standing at the teller's window start to unload, and they are shooting nonstop at Frank, who's behind his desk, returning fire. At that moment, coming out of the vault, at that just wrong moment, Daniel McLean comes walking out of the vault, carrying a large ledger book. If you know what a ledger book looked like in those days, they're very big books. He, see, he walks out, the gunfire starts, he sees what's going on, somebody looks at him, and evidently had pointed their gun at him, he put the, the book up in front of his face, they pull the trigger, the bullet went through the book, and hits him square in the forehead. And Frank, or uh, Daniel McClain, falls to the ground. As that is happening, two of the bank robbers open the door, rush into the vault, and come running back out. While this is going on, and there are many, many shots being fired, in fact, Afterwards, they gathered up uh, over 40 shell casings. So you can imagine this little bank, uh, what it must have been like. In fact, uh, George Belzinger referred to it as the shooting gallery. As this is happening, Mrs. Chandler over in the, the men's clothing store hears all the shooting, looks out the back window, and is trying to see if she can see what's going on. But she can hear all this gunfire coming from the direction of the bank. And she puts two and two together. She runs out the front door. And who is strolling down the street, smoking a big stogie, but Squire George Belcher. She runs outside and she yells, George, George, they're robbing the bank. Well, George is shocked. He's been hearing all this gunfire, but he hadn't put two and two together like she had. And suddenly he realizes, yes, that's what all this gunfire is. He runs on down the street and he gets to the railroad crossing that leads up to Poplar, where the bank is. And he's from this embankment and has to kind of scramble up the bank embankment. As he gets up there, 
Joseph Offerman comes running out of his men's clothing store with a pistol in each hand. He's got a gun in each hand. George sees this, and of course, remember, George is very important. He runs over and he takes both pistols away from Joseph Offerman. Joseph Offerman saying there's nothing. As he's standing there holding these two pistols and all this shooting is still going on, up runs another man, whose name is Mike Delco, carrying a Winchester punk shotgun. George's eyes light up. Whoa, what a shotgun. So he runs over to Mike Delco, takes the shotgun away from him, hands him one of Joseph Offerman's pistols, and says, come on with me. As he's about to turn around and start up the street, up pulls Dr. Carr in his car and jumps out and says, what is going on? He hands him one of the pistols and says, come on, we're going to go up to the bank and see what's going on. And so the three men, Joseph Offerman, he stays behind, he doesn't have any pistols now. <laughs> the three men go up to the front porch of Martin's grocery store and they, they get themselves kind of up against the wall, you know, and looking around the corner to see what's going on. And then, much to uh, George's credit, George walks up to the front door, looks in, and then stands at the bottom of the steps waiting for the robbers to emerge. He yells to Dr. Carr, go around the back of the bank and uh, keep your eye on the back door of the bank. Dr. Carr then goes up here and waits back here. So now we have George sitting, standing at the bottom of the steps with his pump shotgun waiting. And as he's waiting for the bank robbers to come out, they come out two at a time, the first two out are Sam Barcon and uh, John Tush. They come out and they look at him. The other two bank robbers come right out behind them. George, standing at the bottom of the steps, this is like a scene out of a John Wayne uh, uh, True Grit movie. He's standing there with a shotgun and he yells, throw up your hands, you sons of bitches. And these four drunks are standing in front of him. <laughs> and they look at him and he doesn't wait. He snaps the trigger. Nothing happens. <laughs> he pumps the gun, pulls it, pumps it again, pulls the trigger, and he's testified at trial. He said, I snapped the trigger three times and nothing come from it. The gun was empty. He had traded two loaded pistols for an empty shotgun. Meanwhile, at the top of these steps are four drunk bank robbers, and they start blazing away at him. George testifies at trial. He says, It got a little warm. <laughs> George decides he better take off and get out of there because now he is uh, the main target. And he runs around, he grabs off the car, and he heads for the back corner of the back. The robbers, as they come out, at this point, see him take off in that direction, not realizing where he's going, they go that direction. As they run around to the back of the bank, it's, it's like the Keystone Cops. They get around to the back of the bank, they literally run right into each other. And bounce off of each other. The one bank robber is carrying a bag of coins, probably silver dollars, and he takes them and he hits George Beltsuver square in the face with this bag of coins and breaks his nose. And if you've ever seen a broken nose, they bleed like crazy. George is knocked into next week. He is just in La La Land trying to figure out what the heck happened. The bank robbers at this point, realize, you know, there, here's Dr. Kerr with his gun, and he pulls up his gun. They decide that it's time to make a different getaway. Now, this is where the story gets a little more complicated because the getaway 
doesn't just go as planned, it ends up being two separate chases. So the bank robbers now run back to the front of the bank here. As they get to the front of the bank, from across the street, from the second story window, the young girl from Martin's grocery store had gone home for lunch, heard the shooting, ran upstairs, got her dad's deer rifle, and was now shooting at the bank robbers who were in front of the bank. She doesn't hit anything, but she scares the pants off them. At this point, these four drunks, they don't know what to do, they just take off running. Two run in this direction, and two run towards the car. Remember, they're disoriented, they're drunk, they don't know where they are, the men don't really know the town, and the two that take off, Sam Barkons and, and uh, uh, John Tush, start heading up the street towards uh, the golf course. Now, I need to say something here, and I have to be very politically correct. John Tush was weight challenged. <laughs> okay. This is all uphill. They start taking off. They run back uh, through the backyard here. They run right through Dr. Carr's backyard. In fact, when, as they jump over the fence, uh, Sam Barkon stumbles, falls, gets back up, and doesn't realize his gun has fallen out of his pocket. So now only Tush has a gun. As they're running up the street, at the back of the bank, the doctor's taking care of George's broken nose. Up walks J.J. Doyle, the, the uh, pharmacist, and he looks at him and uh, he sees what's going on. And George, remember, he, George is dazed. He's, he's really out of it. He turns around to Doyle and says, go with the doctor. Here, take my shotgun and go with him. He hands him an empty shotgun. Oh, now, yeah. the doctor has no clue that it's empty because remember, the doctor was behind the bank. He has no clue that the shotgun's empty. So, the doctor and J.J. Doyle, they understand the town, the lay of the land, and they split up. The doctor takes off and he heads up in this direction. J.J. Doyle runs down the street. There's a, there's a ravine here that he then goes up and he gets the, they get the bank robbers trapped in between them. Doyle on this ridge, Dr. Kerr up on this ridge, and the bank robbers running along the other ridge. As they get up there, the, uh, they're, they're uh, trading shots with the doctor. Doyle's too far away, he's got a shotgun, you know, he, he don't shoot long distance with a shotgun. And as he, they're trading shots, Tush is, he's done, he's exhausted. He, is, he, he can't take another step. He stops and he yells to Sam Barkons, shoot yourself. <laughs> and Barkons, uh, no, And Tush takes his gun, puts it to his head, and kills himself. Barkons, being such a good friend, runs back to Tush and grabs a pistol and runs off. Dr. Kerr now sees him heading off in this direction. And as uh, Tush has shot himself here, the doctor is coming up here, and now he's running towards Doyle. Doyle draws a beat on him, pulls the shotgun up, and <laughs> click. <laughs> Doyle, probably much to the doctor's uh, consternation, yells, I'm out of ammunition. I'll be back. <laughs> and he heads back into town to get more uh, ammunition and to get more people to help. Well, the doctor pursues uh, Barkons to the edge here of the, uh, the today it's a fairway, this is a, I forget what fairway that is now, they keep changing them on me, I think it's fairway number five, but anyway, it parallels Sleepy Hollow Road, and right there, there is a set of woods, the woods are still there today. The, uh, the bank robber, Barkons, runs down into what that time was called Wild Woods, and disappears. The doctor stops at the edge of the wood, looks down in there and says, I'm not going in there. If I go in there, he'll step out from behind a tree and pop me. I am not doing that. So the doctor just waits 
for reinforcements to show up. Meanwhile, now you have to understand something. In the length of time I'm telling this story, it's virtually over. All right, this this is all happening very quickly. So you know I'm making the story much longer than it really is, uh, or longer than it was that took place. Uh, but while the chase across the golf course is going on, over at Saxon Wall Nursery, and again this is where Route 88 was right here. On Sac Saxon Wall Nursery, they get a phone call. We don't know who called. Probably just a local operator uh, called over there and said, uh, gets Ernest Fisher on the on line and says, uh, Ernie, the bank's been robbed and some of the bank robbers are headed in your direction because they were crossing the golf course, heading down towards uh, that area. Fisher immediately goes over to his house over here, gets his guns, he's a deer hunter, and he, he starts off uh, across the road and goes down to what was at that time called Linden Grove Station. Today it's just called the Grove. Growing up, you probably danced there as kids, right? How many danced at Linden Grove? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you know remember what we're talking. Well, this is what Linden Grove looked like at that time. This is this is Sleepy Hollow Road. Incredibly, when they finally built the road, they left that bend in there. They didn't even walk there straight now. It's still there today. But where I would be standing in this picture is the railroad tunnel, and on in front of me would be the Grove. Okay, so this is Grove Road. Uh, back here today is uh, uh, Cochrane uh, Dealerships uh, Parts Department or something. Used to be a giant eagle, correct? Okay, so Ernie Fisher goes walking down the road, and as he gets down there, there's a farmhouse right here. Okay, and this is like an old vaudeville joke. So Ernie Fisher walking down there and runs into the farmer and his daughter. All right. And uh, the farmer says, well, hey, you're looking for somebody. And he said, uh, yeah, I am. He said, yeah, I saw some guy running through the woods up there. Fisher says, really? He said, yeah. He said, I think he laid down somewhere up in the woods because I saw him kind of dive down. He said, good, God. Fisher, dear honor, stalks his prey, goes up into the woods, very quietly walks through the woods until he sees two trees that had fallen down and he sees some feet sticking out from the trees. <laughs> and he very quietly walks up, gets right on top of them, puts his gun barrel right on his head and yells, if you move, I'll blow your head off. As he's doing that, here comes the doctor, J.J. Doyle, and reinforcements from the town crashing down through the woods, and Fisher yells, I've got him, I've got him, come on down. They come running down. As they get down there, Doyle, who was Frank Irby's very good friend, has found out that Irby is dying. He's been shot up badly, and he's dying, and he is furious. He gets down there, he sees the bank robber, reaches down, picks him up, and proceeds to beat the stuffing out of this guy. He is just pounding on this guy. And finally, the doctor stops him. You know, Hippocratic oath here, okay? Don't do more damage. And he stops him because he said, you know, he's acting kind of funny. And the doctor looks at him a little more closely and he realizes he has shot himself in the head. He has taken the pistol, put it inside his mouth, pulled the trigger, the bullet proceeded through his head, missed both sides of his brain, went directly between the brains, out the top of his head, and he was perfectly okay. <laughs> Except that he had a really bad head. <laughs> the doctor looks at him, realizes he's been shot, says the guy is okay, you know, quit beating him up. <laughs> Let's take him back to the car. So they walk him back down to uh, Linden Grove, uh, which is about a quarter of a mile, and this poor guy, you know, he's shot through the head and he's only beat up. In fact, uh, they testified at trial. Uh, they, they asked the doctor, they said, uh, uh, did he tell you anything when you uh, uh, caught him in the woods? And he said, he really didn't have a chance to say much. Okay? Uh, in other words, we were busy beating him up. So, we didn't have time to say much. so they throw him in the back of uh, Fisher's car and they take him back into uh, town and uh, uh, 
I'll take you to George Peltzinger's house. Remember, he's squire. So, meantime, the other part of the chase is unfolding. As these two bank robbers are heading in this direction, now the other two are heading back towards the car. As they start to run up the street, everybody in town is coming out of their houses armed and loaded uh, and firing away. And it is a running gun battle up the street. The robbers are running for their lives, carrying uh, bags of money. Their clothing is stuffed full of money. And they're not stopping to shoot it out. As they're running, they're literally just firing over their shoulders, just you know, trying to keep their heads down behind them. As they're running up the street, uh, from here to railroad station, Nick Yost hears the guns fire, realizes what's going on, and of course, like any good run blooded American, pulls the two pistols out of his desk and uh, heads up to Washington Avenue and joins in the chase. And he is running down the street, he's right behind these guys, and he's plugging away at them. And one of the bank robbers throws a shot over his shoulder and hits Nick in the shin. Unbelievable shot. Nick falls down on the road, empties his pistols, and the robbers run and jump in the car. Okay. Nick Kemenos is in the car, hears all this going on, seeing them coming, and they're, they're yelling, start the car, start the car. <laughs> and they run up, and they jump in the car, and Kemenos says, what in the world's going on? They said, just get out of here. We got into a bar fight. <laughs> and everybody in town is after us. And he's, and Kemenos is like, oh, yeah. Okay. And off he goes. So, as soon as they take off, George Beltsuver finally has regained his senses. He comes staggering into town, and now all the men see them taking off in the car, and they said, George, what do we do? George says, get your cars and let's go. They all kind of looked at each other and said, well, I don't know. <laughs> so, if you don't have a car, where do you go? You go to the funeral director. <laughs> They go over to Lachlan's funeral homes, same Lachlan that's there today, and they said to Ed Lachlan, hey Ed, can we borrow the hearse? <laughs> and Lachlan says, yeah, okay. <laughs> he said, but the problem is, uh, see, he also does livery boarding and sales. Uh, by the way, he also does moving and general hauling. <laughs> he's not using a hearse to haul bodies. He's, he's hauling other stuff. He says, uh, uh, to get the car out of there, you've got to uh, push the, uh, the wagon out of the way first, then you can take the car out with the uh, hearse. So they push the, the hearse out, eventually they crank it up, they finally get started. Eleven men jump in the hearse. <laughs> As they do, someone else who in town did have a car comes uh, rolling up, and three or four more men jump in that car, and off they go. And the pursuit is on. And you can see this is a, a Mud Street, the Dirt Street. And uh, uh, it's right up here is where the paving starts. They head on up, and they are in now hot pursuit. They go tearing along, and remember, they've got at least a good 10 minute head start on them, maybe even more. They get up to Green Tree Road, and as they're going down Green Tree Road, there's Nick Kemenos, just putting along at about five miles an hour. They come flying up on them. This is like, you know, a, a, a police uh, uh, fugitive chase. They, they block him in. They, they pull the cars and block him in. He has no idea what's going on. They pull him out of the car, beat the tar out of this poor guy, and said, well, where's the other two bank robbers? And he said, oh, they got out of the car two, three miles back. They said they didn't like the way I drove, and they didn't want to go with me any further. Well, today, what we've summarized, summarized from this is that in Green Tree, there are numerous abandoned coal mines. And we think that part of the getaway plan originally was to get out of the, the getaway car uh, and hide in one of the mines until the problems blew over and they could then uh, get going. Because these two men disappeared and were never seen again. 
Kemenos, of course, is hauled back into town and is horribly beaten uh, by the time it gets there. When they get there, two Allegheny County uh, police detectives have shown up to take control of the situation. And they would testify later that uh, Barcon's face was so badly beaten that they couldn't even make out any features on his face. Uh, that they had just, and of course, bullet through your head probably has something to do with that too. But he was uh, 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 tremendously uh, uh, beaten. They also testified that when they got there, the, <laughs> not the men, the women in town were screaming, hang them, hang them! <laughs> because two of their favorite people were dead or dying. And they, the women, were furious uh, about this. Well, yeah, Dan McLean shot the head and leg as he lay dying on the floor in the bank, Mrs. McKellar came over. She sat down and she cradled his head in her lap, talked with him until he died. Frank Irby, behind the desk, was shot in the head, the back, the chest, the right arm, and the left shoulder. He survived about an hour and a half, died on the way to Southside Hospital. If you don't think this wasn't a shootout, this tells you. This man was in a, the battle for his life. And unfortunately for him, uh, they had more guns and probably a little bit better cover than he did. Frank Irby died. Oh, Out on the way to the hospital. Well, of the $17,000, that they took out of the bank that day. 9,000 was recovered on Barcons and Tush, and money that was dropped all over the town. So, how do you know it was their money? Their name was printed on it. In those days, you could ask the print, the, the mint to print the name of your bank on your money. Okay, it was a form of advertising, actually. The, uh, a friend of mine, let me take a picture of this. This is one of only five known in existence. Uh, he paid $10,000 for this bank note. Very, very rare. Uh, uh, $8,000 disappeared with Mike Tidoff and Haraska Garrison. So what happened? Well. The best guess was that they probably headed for New York City, jumped on board a freighter, which you could do in those days easily, you know. You just sign on as a crew member, and headed back to, to Russia. That was the guess. The reason they guessed that, or thought that, partly was they went and they interviewed uh, Titoff's sister, the one that owned the boarding house where Kevin Oaks lived in the car, right? had the car. And she said, you know, I would think he probably went back home. Well, until two months ago, this was still a mystery. Mystery solved. <coughs> two months ago, a person uh, videotaped me and put this on YouTube. <coughs> a woman watched it, immediately sent me an email and said, I am Mike Tidoff's great niece. His sister was my grandmother. When my grandmother uh, uh, owned the boarding house, they lived practically hand to mouth because her husband was a coal miner who had black lung and could not work. So all they could do was run a boarding house. Miraculously, the year after the bank robbery, she bought a car. <laughs> and she, the, the lady told me, she said, we always wondered, how did Grandma get that much money to buy a car? Mm -hmm. Grandma claims she never knew about the bank robbery until afterwards. Well, in uh, 19, uh, or in uh, the year 
2000, I think it was, this lady's relatives were visiting Russia. And they were relaying this story about uh, Mikhail Tidoff to, their, to the family. And they said, no one ever knew what happened to him. And the family said, oh, he came here. He, he had a wife and he lived you know, a couple villages over. So he did make it back to Russia. But he had all this money in his pocket. It's 1917. What happens in Russia in October of 1917? The Russian Revolution. I'm sure all that money got confiscated by the government, and he probably was back to being a factory worker or coal miner or whatever. Garrison, we have no clue. Barcons was put on trial and found guilty of uh, first degree murder, was electrocuted uh, in January of 1919. Uh, no one claimed the body is buried there at the prison in the Hopper's Field. Nick Kemenos, the getaway car driver, is put on trial. He is found not guilty of Frank Irby's death. Okay? So they said, all right, fine. We'll put you on trial for Daniel McLean's murder. And he gets found guilty. Well, immediately, his lawyers claimed double jeopardy. Now, a couple years ago, I, had, I gave this talk, and I had a judge in the audience, and I asked the judge, I said, What's your take on this? Is this double jeopardy? And he said, yeah. in that time period, it actually would not have been double jeopardy. Today, when two murders occur simultaneously in one crime, it is one crime. You cannot put them on trial uh, for everything that occurs one thing at a time. It's all one crime. All the charges are lumped in together at one crime. So it would have been double jeopardy today. What's interesting is he was found not guilty the first time the people believed him when he said, I had nothing to do with this. When they arrested him, he had in his pocket $7. <laughs> That's what they paid him to take him out there. Okay. Well, while waiting for his appeal on double jeopardy, we have his appeal to public court papers. Uh, he died in prison from Spanish influenza. That same year that millions and millions of people died. And I just throw this in because I think it's interesting. The Stanley Cup that year was canceled because of the Spanish flu. Can you imagine today if they announced, oh, we're going to cancel the Stanley Cup. The Penguins are just going to go. <laughs> Ooh, I don't think so. Okay. What about the kids? Their mother had died the year before. Now their mother their dad is dead. The oldest, Margaret, told her daughter, when we interviewed her daughter, uh, she was up for St. Clair, uh, told her daughter that the day her dad was killed, someone knocked on the front door, handed her his lunch pail, and said, your dad was killed today. Have a nice day. And left. The three kids were sent to three separate families, uh, all relatives, uh, who raised them. Well, tried to. Margaret was very strong with her, her daughter. Told us a lot of good stories about her. Um, at age 16, she ran away. At age 17, was married. And by age 18, had a baby. By age 19, was divorced and put herself through college and became a professional woman. I forget now uh, what, what, what it was that she did, uh, but she uh, uh, then kind of turned her life around. <coughs> the two boys, uh, Harold, uh, uh, flew jet uh, planes in Korea, uh, retired from the Air Force as a colonel. And the younger one, Harold, uh, who was the only one we could interview, uh, knew, remembered absolutely nothing. And his family never talked about it, that raised him. Uh, 
you know, it's one of those, not family secrets, but you just don't talk about it. And so he really knew nothing. Very friendly, nice guy, but had, had nothing to tell us of, uh, uh, about the robbery itself. So it's kind of a, so, an amazing story, but uh, in the end, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of tragic. It's, it's pretty sad because these four immigrants that came here uh, took advantage of the situation and left the three children uh, as orphans in the end. So that's the great Castle Shannon bank robber. And uh, I think it's an amazing story to tell. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to entertain any questions at this time. Yes? So when George was at the foot of the step, he had two shotguns, and they were shooting at him. Did he get shot? He? Not you got four drunks standing from me to you, and they all missed. Okay? Which, he, yeah, he, he was bulletproof. Okay? Yeah, George was full. One, I was giving this story one day, I was picking on George in the water. And this lady raised her hand. I said, yes. She said, George is my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Nicest guy I ever heard about. Okay. It was too late at that point. And she laughed. She said, yeah, we, we all knew all about George. <laughs> so, any other uh, questions? Yes. So this happened in Castle Shannon. When was the Great Brinks robbery in Bethlehem? In 1927, okay. uh, out on Brightwood Road. Uh, actually, uh, someone asked me if I had another uh, talk. I'm working on that now. Okay, that's that's going to be another talk I'll have. Uh, it takes me a long time. Uh, the preparation for these uh, is, I don't like to tell the story unless I have all of the information. And uh, I'm just at the ground floor of this. I got a lot, a lot of research to do. I'm curious when you said the road was paved, what looked to be going out of town, and yes. not ever paved where the businesses were. What was that about? <laughs> Do we know? You know, uh, I, can't, I can't answer that. I don't know why uh, it started where it started. Maybe they just hadn't finished it yet. That might have been uh, what was going on. I don't really know. Uh, they, it was... Uh, you think that when it started, where the main businesses were? Right. It, it like started down towards Banksville. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my my view, my guess is that Allegheny County was starting there and working outward. Huh? And, that, that, and that's only a guess. I mean, don't you know, uh, speculation. It was paved uh, with uh, what we would call today asphalt. That time was uh, called. Uh, it was a macadamized road. It was. Uh, uh, named after a guy named McCann, uh, who invented the process of making this kind of tar uh, chip type of uh, uh, work. Thank you. I think, I think that's the borderline between Mount Lebanon and Castle Shannon. So. That's a good point. You're yeah. absolutely right. That is that is where the borderline is. Yeah, you are absolutely right. That is, I hadn't thought about that. That is right where the border is. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that might be the real answer. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Uh, you mentioned all those buildings had Castle Shannon Bank. Yeah. Is it, is it odd that that's some money, none of them ever, it's like, you know, all, all, the, all the money they, they stole in the park. Uh, none, none of it ever. You know, it didn't seem to resurface uh, uh, immediately or, or within, uh, like, the time that allowed them to, to do some tracking. Uh, but, um, you know, if they took most of it to Russia with them, my guess is when they got there, it's a confiscated. Because with the Russian Revolution going on, you know, uh, communism, socialism, I think everything is owned by the state. That's all. Your sister wants Well, yeah, that's true. Now, it, let me say, not only did they take uh, paper money, they took bags of, of uh, coins and take a big bag of silver dollars, all money. Can be in those bags. Um, those bills later, when the government turned around and they recalled all those bills, those bills would have been called in and destroyed. So there wouldn't have been any left by the public. Yeah, eventually they. There's only a few of them shown. That's right. Eventually they were all. That's why this is a couple. Uh, this one that I just showed you was actually found in the wall of a house that, that was being demolished. Somebody had tucked it away 
you know, for safekeeping. They forgot it was in there. And uh, when they were demolishing this house, somebody found it. And uh, as I said, uh, this friend uh, bought it for ten thousand dollars. Better things to do with ten thousand dollars and a piece of paper. Um, you said students don't get away from this. Um, what did you think he was doing? Driving them around the drain? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, you know, I, that's a good point, and I absolutely skipped right over that. They told him that they were going to Castle Shannon to apply. They'd all been fired from their jobs, and they were applying for jobs in the coal mines, is what they told him. Okay. And, uh, and that sounded very feasible. Again, uh, Kemenos had a solid alibi. Everything, every question they asked him, he had an answer that was very solid. And uh, I, I believe he was in his, Oh, Stanley Bravo. Let's get back to him for a second. Stanley Bravo in the bank at the time of the robbery. $17,000 in cash in the bank. Why so much money? It was a mine payroll. Who in town would know when the bank has mine payrolls in there? Maybe the guy that is the foreman at the local building supply company that deals with the mines every single day. Who happens to speak Russian? Who happens to eat at the Waterman Hotel virtually every day? whose story changed every single time he testified. I, what I should do sometimes is just print out all his testimony and put it up here on the screen because and just put them all side by side. It, it, it just varies. You know, he actually, he, he, and, and it's amazing, so why, nobody picked up on this. Why would he have to be there then? He was there, I think, to, you know, in a sense, sort of help out if things were going wrong. He, he, speak Russian, he could speak English, you know, whatever, you know, he, he could in some way be part of it. I don't know, maybe he planned to uh, uh, give the, give a different story uh, on how things happened or not. I don't know, we don't know. But he, he says that after the bank robbers ran out the front door, he stood up and the rope that he was tied with fell off. <laughs> oh, there's a good really job. Right? So, is Stanley guilty? I don't know. But it sure doesn't sound good to me. Yes? I just want to know what day of the week it was. Uh, it, uh, you know, I've looked this up. And I, you know, I, I've looked this up and now I can't remember. I think it's, I, actually, I think it's a Monday. Let me look at the newspaper see if I can see it on the paper. Okay, so this is the Tuesday evening edition, May 15th. Yeah, so it was a Monday. So it was a Monday. Oh, it came out actually that afternoon. They, you know, now they would rush out and go, extra, extra. They rushed out uh, um, some broadsides. Almost immediately, and uh, in fact, Frank Irby's um, uh, aunt was riding the streetcar home, and she was standing, and the guy sitting next to her was reading the newspaper, and she reads, and Frank Irby was killed. And she gets home and heads for their house, and they already knew about it at that point, but she found out reading the afternoon newspaper on the way home. If you remember when, when we were kids, uh, you got the morning paper and the afternoon paper. You know, two papers. And at some time, uh, I think the post was that or the press, I don't remember which, actually did both. They did a morning and an afternoon paper. So that was pretty Remember, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't news change. Oh, the, the reporters came out there and then they were on the phones. They were phoning it back downtown, and yeah, that was one of the technologies, and uh, they were immediately went to work and got this. Any other questions? Yes. So I love this feeling. No. The getaway driver. Yeah. What was he doing 
while he was waiting for them to come back to the car. He slept in the car. In the car. He was, that's why they were yelling. Start the car because he was asleep in the car. And he didn't realize what was going on until he heard them shouting. And he sat up and looked around. And bullets were whizzing around over his head. And he starts the car and off they all come. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for inviting me.